American rocket technician Daniel Fry claimed he witnessed a UFO landing near the White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico. He was invited aboard and received a message for mankind. My most uh, significant experience that I had is probably the finding out of uh, the major purpose for this uh, invasion, so to speak, was to keep uh, this planet alive that we're approaching an area of controversy which could result in, in, in the displacement of all humanity because we had learned how to do that without learning how to get along with each other. Later, Fry shot some films of unknown flying objects. Contactees and UFO enthusiasts met regularly at the giant rock in the Californian desert at the site where contactee George von Tassel claimed to have met space people and where he later built, allegedly under their instruction, the Integraton, a generator to reactivate human cells and to charge them with cosmic energy as claimed by von Tassel. One of the early contactees who spoke regularly on the giant rock conventions was Howard Menger. Menger presented what many UFO enthusiasts had long waited for, physical evidence and a message of deepness and beauty. I was inspired by a trip to New York State in the Catskills. I was on my way up there under some kind of control. It seemed almost like my, the wheel was moving by itself. I know it sounds strange, but it, it's true. And I reached a, an old cabin in the woods, and inside there were what I considered to be aliens. Uh, they were not uh, from this world, as far as I could see. They're very angelic uh, uh, p uh, people. And they had all kinds of instruments in the cabin, uh, all types of electronic, uh, like what we'd call uh, pianos and organs. And on the uh, wall, they had a one-inch thick two-by-two two television screen. And they could move it anywhere they wanted to. Uh, I think we're getting that nowadays. We're getting into that now, uh, 35, 40 years later. But I went in there and they showed me the instruments, the musical instruments, and I expressed the wish that I wish I could play the piano. And they said, well, uh, maybe we can help you. I don't know what they did, but I could sit down after that visit to the cabin, after meeting these wonderful people, and I could play anything by ear. I think it all began when I was very young, approximately 10 years old, in the early 30s, when I went up into the woods, as I often did, uh, and saw a beautiful lady on, on a rock with a stream going by. And I was really, really surprised because <clears throat> first I thought it was one of the farm people, because there were farms nearby. But this woman wasn't dressed in a farm outfit. She was dressed in beautiful, flowing gown. And she had long blonde hair and gold-colored eyes. And she seemed to be waiting for me uh, as though uh, she knew I'd be there. And when, when she spoke, she spoke in perfect English and a beautiful voice. And I was only 10 years old, but I want to tell you, this, this was quite an experience. She was like an angel, like talking to an angel. And she seemed to know all about me. And she mentioned some things that would happen in the near future. She departed like almost like a vision just disappeared and I went back home I didn't talk about it for for weeks not even to my brother uh, who often went up in the woods with me we saw discs in the sky my brother and I uh, during that period that same period 
And as uh, time went on, some of the things that she had predicted were coming true. They continued from the girl on the rock right on up to uh, the very significant ones in 1956 when the craft came in, these huge 40 to 50 foot craft, and they carried these beautiful angelic aliens. And uh, at, of course, at first I wasn't ready for any of this. No cameras, no recording equipment, no witnesses. But after that, I prepared myself with cameras, uh, uh, witnesses. I had witnesses. I had. Uh, I was taking a movie on one incident in 1956 in Highbridge, New Jersey, uh, where a craft was coming in. It's in my new book, The uh, Highbridge Incident. The pictures are in there. And the craft is coming in, and I'm taking a, a colored movie, eight millimeter movie of this. I have, I have several witnesses from the local area and also a federal agent from the Bureau in Newark, New Jersey, was standing right next to me. I was filming a craft coming in. The door opens when it landed, and two men got out. One went to the left, one went to the right, and then a beautiful lady got out. But she had a type of spacesuit on. And she walked toward me, and when she got about 25 or 30 feet from me, she didn't say a word. And she touched something shiny on her belt. And that shiny thing got bigger and bigger and bigger and finally enveloped her whole body to where I could see her body as a light form. And then it disappeared. And I, I was really, uh, really uh, surprised. I, I yelled back at the craft. I said, where did she go? Where is she? And they yelled back in perfect Oxford English, she's here with us in the ship. So evidently their technology has taken them into some type of teleportation, which we haven't, we haven't approached that yet. Our scientists have not approached that yet, that I know of. And so uh, evidently they, uh, they have mastered time, motion, and energy in some way. Uh, shortly after that, the, door, the two men went in the craft, the door closed, and it silently rose and left the area. I only have parts of it and slides I made from the original. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Bureau out of Newark, New Jersey, took the original film. As you know, there is a definite government cover-up for three reasons, political, religious, and scientific, and for national security. Indeed, Menger had hundreds of eyewitnesses at that time. Psychiatrist Dr. Berthold Schwartz spoke with about 40 of them and became convinced that Menger's contacts were real experiences. Well, living in northern New Jersey, where I practiced medicine for many years, I used to hear years ago on the radio Howard Menger on the Long John Neville show. And I was quite interested, to put it mildly, how could someone make these statements and make all these claims and these other things going on? Then, of course, reading about it in the papers, and my patients would ask questions. People would across the board, straight Americans. So one thing led to another, and then by fortuitous luck or whatever, coincidence, I met different people that were closely associated with Howard, leading citizens, not just average Joes, good, solid Americans. And they had quite a story to tell me. So the ball of yarn started to unroll, and I became more and more involved in who this man is, where he's coming from, how do you explain these things? One man himself was quite a well-known inventor. He knew Howard's family. Another one was being reporter for the highest circulation paper in northern New Jersey, who happened to be a classmate of my roommate at Dartmouth College years ago. So I had a, a contact there. The fellow opened up. He did a whole series of stories. And he said, I don't know this thing, but it, Howard is truthful. He's telling it as it is. The story never changes. It's the same way. And in that town of Washington, New Jersey, I interviewed this high school principal. At that time, I interviewed a blind lady, but a very refined woman of some note locally. And she told me quite a story with another teacher and a physician. Oh, gosh, you name it. Another fellow lived in the south 
part where they have all the hunting, and he kept on the moon potatoes that Howard had, so-called, the specimen he picked up, wherever he was, out in space, who knows. But these people swore by him. They told some extraordinary stories. What did those eyewitnesses see? What did they describe? Well, I remember once, of course, the uh, craft or whatever they are, the lights in the sky and the landings in the field, the, the great sociological, psychosocial significance of thousands of people present. And again, through synchronicity or luck, I had this patient whose father happened to be in the state police of New Jersey, so they wouldn't, as a physician, they're usually most courteous to me, occupationally perhaps. I went in and they opened the door and they said, we cannot explain this, we do not understand it, but yes, this is on the level, these strange things happen. And matter of fact, you couldn't shut them up, they <laughs> had to go on and on. So, quite a story. Uh, there were people that said they saw uh, lights in the sky and things that darted very fast that didn't look like uh, a helicopter or a plane because it moved too swiftly. And I remember uh, we all came down to look at the field where the flying saucer had landed, where he said it had landed, and it was round like burnt mark on the ground where the grass had all been singed. And in the 1950s, a young high school boy came to me and said this man was taking them up in the wood and showing them lights that glowed. And he told them the lights came from flying saucers, from men who were landing regularly in a place called High Bridge, New Jersey. It's about 10 miles from here, from Washington, where we are now. And I knew this young boy, and I... Uh, prevail upon him to uh, tell me more about it. I was interested as a newspaper man, and uh, he told me who the man was, and it was Howard Menger. At that time, Howard Menger was a sign painter in a sign painting shop just about two blocks from this house, up around the corner, and I knew Howard, knew his wife, knew his children, knew his family, and um, as a reporter, I thought, I have to find out more about this. So I got a hold of a couple of friends of mine from the state police, and uh, we went to visit Howard, and he said, oh yeah, they're up there, and he showed us some photographs he had made of flying saucers, and he asked us if we would like to uh, meet these people from outer space, and of course we said yes. So he took us up to a field up on top of the mountain and said they'd be there at about 11 o'clock at night, and uh, we just had to wait, and uh, needless to say, uh, we waited and waited, and nobody ever showed up. Howard later told me, he said, one of those guys that was with you was carrying a gun. He said, Howard, all those guys were carrying guns. They're all state police, state policemen. So one evening, uh, he advised me that there would be a sighting he believed, so I took a a girl I was dating at the time, whose name was Dorothy, and his and a friend uh, uh, who worked for my father, his name was Richard Barry, and he was repairing televisions for my father. He was a student, I think, of Princeton at the time. I couldn't drive, I didn't have a license at the time. So Richard drove Dorothy and myself down there, and we met at Howard's house, sat in his kitchen, had cocoa, as I recall, and he said, let's go up into the woods and we'll see if... He said, I think the ships are here. So we did. And it was Howard, his wife Rose, his sister-in-law Mary, who I think was single at the time, myself, Dorothy, and Mr. Barry. So. And we broke up into groups. Howard and uh, uh, two of the women went one way, and myself and M Mr. Barry and Dorothy went another way and, was, and we walked down this wood trail and we did see these pulsating lights in a ravine on the ground and uh, these were believed to be the, 
Uh, he said they were scout ships. And they seemed to be uh, translucent. Like you could see through them and they seemed to have bright, brighter cores inside like a vacuum, like a light bulb would do or, or a vacuum tube would do. And they would change colors. They'd be pink and then they'd be green and then they'd be white and whatever. And they just kind of seemed to hover over the ground. One of them did seem to put out a little light which kind of went round us, I think, and then went back in again. And uh, we were awestruck. There's no doubt about that. I remember I'm 16 years old and never saw anything like this in my life. And quite believed everything that we saw was, in fact, out of this world. So we went back down to his house and he said, I think one of the alien people uh, trust this group and they're going to make themselves visible. So we went out and stood in his backyard in, in a lawn area and it goes up to a hillside. It was in meadows. And within a short period of time, Howard says, look, here comes one now. And there was this kind of ghosty apparition of a, of a human figure which kind of floated across the meadow. I remember he kind of went over a fence, kind of just floated over a, a, a barbed wire fence and uh, came near to us, but not that near that you could distinguish any features. I'm talking maybe several hundred feet. And then he faded away back into the woodland. And that was it. And we went back to the house and we were just like, whoa. <laughs> greatest thing that ever was. Another incident I recall vividly, Augie, Augie Roberts, the photographer who was documented so much of this from the early days forward, was once at Howard's house, where Howard was, just after a whole series of exciting events out in the field with the craft landing, whatever the thing was, and Howard was alone in the house. Augie knew that, and yet Howard was carrying on a conversation with another voice. Now, unless Howard is the world's greatest ventriloquist, which to my knowledge he isn't, Augie said, what is going on here? One of the curious who wanted to see firsthand what was behind Menger's contacts was the young journalist, Constant Michels. She was so fascinated by the young contactee that she felt in love and married Howard Menger in 1958. Shortly after that, she had her own first UFO encounter. I have never seen a landed disc, but... One evening, shortly after we, we were married, we were coming home from grocery shopping, and as we came up on the hill on the farm, we parked the car against the fence, and there was a big, luminous, pearl-like, pearl uh, spherical shape right above the trees over the next field. And Howard stopped. He said, look. And I said, oh, wait, I've got to get my camera. And I, by the time I got to the station where I can turn around and get the camera, it was gone. That was one of the times. When we were on our honeymoon in Las Vegas, we saw the same pearl-like iridescent glo globular disc. And uh, one more time, which this, this really gets me, but it was, in, um, hunt it was on our farm, and we were there, our attorney was with us, and uh, we had heard that some people at White House, they were having a game, and they had seen discs flying over the stadium. So we went out to in the field and looked upward and sure enough there was a fleet of disc flying overhead and our attorney turned to me and said Connie this is for you and one of the disc dipped just like that and that was that day or that week I became cognizant of the fact that I was uh, pregnant I was with child our first child Howard Menger is a, a, a truthful person who's had some extraordinary experiences, and as I think he says himself, he cannot explain them. He doesn't understand them. My impression of Howard Menger was that he was a, uh, uh, a man who uh, most people would like. He was quiet. He was calm. Uh, he appeared to be a very thoughtful man. He would seldom give out with a fast answer. He would consider his words and his answers to every question he would ask him. Uh, he was a kind man. He was a kind of a person that you'd like to have as a neighbor. Uh, he minded his own business. He was on the quiet side. 
And uh, you would, it, that's why I think it, uh, he commands so much um, respect because people don't expect to have a guy talking about flying saucers who looks and talks like Howard Menger. He's a father figure. As a psychiatrist, I certainly would say that uh, Howard appears in every way to myself to be a healthy, good citizen, a sound body, mind and body, as most of these people are. We've done formal studies on this long ago. It was just logical to assume that there are non-terrestrials throughout our cosmos. And if they are coming now, as they have come in the past, why could not this young man, who had a good business, who had a family life, who was well known in his community, was well respected, why should he go through all this trouble to get ridiculed and harassed and lose a lot of his business, and for what purpose? It certainly wasn't for money. We, we lost heavily trying to get this, uh, this message across. He eventually lost his first home, and when we were married, we lost our farm home, and we had to just pull up stakes and start all over again, no home at all, and work very hard. So for all those uh, skeptics out there and debunkers, we get very angry, especially I do, when they say, well, you're doing it for money, or you're trying to sell your book. We have mortgaged our home to publish that book because we didn't want it altered and we didn't want the photographs to turn up missing again. So we did it ourselves. So this is not a labor of money, it's a labor of love that we have done for 35 to 40 years. So. I was convinced at that time that, that he was doing it for the same reason. He was losing pitifully, economically. But something was uh, really pushing him on. And I'm very glad that later on the government came and, 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 back, and backed him up to do some of the things he had to do. Unfortunately, it didn't last very long. Menger's most fascinating adventure with the space people was his trip to the moon in August 1956. Well, I remember getting in a craft in the same location. We called it Location One in Highbridge, New Jersey. They invited me in the craft. And they didn't tell me right away where we were going, but I found myself in outer space with a Polaroid camera, and there were about eight or nine people in there with me, aliens, and another a, a man, a friend of mine from Hybers, New Jersey, who at this still, I still don't mention his name because he doesn't want to mention it, but he was in the craft with me. Went to school with him. We were up, we could see through the portholes the earth getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It looked like a blue tennis ball with white uh, clouds over it. Finally, we could see the moon approaching and, and, and getting larger and larger through the portholes, and I took pictures of the moon on the other side of the moon where there's a, uh, a line between the light and the dark and there was like a small city there and our government knows all of this they know it all but they're keeping it from the public time is very difficult when you're flying in these aircraft for instance there's something I did notice on the moon trip I thought it took 10 days but when I come back, I didn't have to shave. So that's less than eight hours. So there's something here in their technology about time. They're time travelers. As far as I know, their technology is so advanced, we may never even have left the planet in a craft. We might have gotten in a craft, and through their technology, uh, contacted the moon section and put it on a screen and I thought, who knows? They're so far ahead of us that I really don't know. Any time that he came back from what he called a contact, he seemed to be very elated, very, very uh, happy and elated and, and uh, just bursting with, with uh, happiness or goodwill. 
It, it seemed to affect him that way. The early phase of his contacts with the extraterrestrial visitors inspired Menger to develop theories about electromagnetism and gravitation and to experiment with exotic UFO propulsions on this base. So what happens in my theory is that the electromagnetic field surrounds the disk, cuts off the cosmic particles coming in so that gravity, which is a push, my theory, uh, is no longer a push in this area because it rises, allowing it to rise. It cancels out the push that I call gravity. That's my own explanation. Now, whether it's true or not, you know what? I don't really know. But on that theory, I did get a craft off the ground. 1951 was when it, things really happened because I built an anti-gravitic electrodynamic propulsion four-foot radio-controlled craft, which looked like a flying saucer. And I flew it quite a bit around Highbridge, New Jersey. And one time in the afternoon, my it got away. My controls, I lost control of it, the radio control. And it went up about 500 feet and then went west. And I was pushing buttons like mad and it just didn't respond, it got away. And I, there goes approximately, today's dollars, $60,000. Now, in those days, money, a dollar was a dollar. And it took me two or three years, a period of that time, to come up saving that kind of money and buying the parts to build a craft like that. But it was successful because two weeks later, FBI agents came out of Newark, New Jersey, to my shop in Washington, New Jersey. I had a machine shop and sign shop there. And they said, Howard Menger, I said, yes. They said, well, we want to tell you that your craft crashed. And they showed me the pieces on the Ohio-Pennsylvania border, which is several hundred miles from Highbridge, New Jersey. So that, uh, and it crashed. I don't know whether it hit a tree or what happened. And uh, they traced me from the parts I bought these parts in electronic shops and hardware stores on Route 22 in New Jersey, and they traced, they went to these stores and traced it down. And they're very good at this, and they came right to my shop and said, stop, don't do it again, keep quiet, the, you will be visited by some representatives from the Pentagon, they are interested in the propulsion system. So. By the time 19, uh, in the fifth, late 50s, they kept coming back in this mat. Now, I didn't put a lot in the book about this because they said not to. But in 19, in the 60s, they didn't have a contract, as you spoke of, but they did sponsor me to go to Colorado Springs and actually build, in cooperation with 80 other scientists, engineers, and all types of of, of, of men who knew what they were doing, build a between 40, 50 foot craft and it flew successfully. And we were shushed up, none of us could talk, and uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. All paid for by the government. I have a picture uh, of a Mercedes Benz that the government paid for for me to travel back and forth. Uh, Colorado Springs and, uh, and Highbridge, New Jersey. The deal with the government had its price. Menger had to leave the UFO movement completely. Yes, they did silence me. I silenced uh, under, uh, 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 voluntarily because of national security, which was their biggest reason. And being a patriotic citizen and a veteran of the United States uh, Army intelligence, uh, uh, back in uh, World War II, yes, uh, I did uh, keep quiet for uh, security reasons. Now, because of those, in those days, the Soviet Union was at odds with us. They were our enemies. And uh, they didn't want this technology or any of this out for fear that it would get in the, hand, the wrong hands and used against us. For a time there, we had to give it up entirely 
any contacts with uh, UFOs or, and Howard was gone so much of the time he was involved with the government, which is it's very it's very difficult for the family. I want to tell you when you're dealing in intelligence work, it's very difficult for wife and family because your husband can't tell you exactly what he's doing or where he's going or when and if he's coming back and that's all left up to conjecture and it gets to be very uncomfortable at times and uh, however that was resolved eventually and Howard decided to give it all up and just devote his time to uh, to me and to the children and to his work until such times it would be more appropriate for us to talk about his experiences and our experiences together. But his life, his thinking, still was overshadowed by his experiences with the space people. They even influenced the life of his children, Heidi and Eric. Deeply. Yeah, well that would, the philosophy was probably the best thing they gave me anyway, mm -hmm. I think. It's, it's given me a good open-mindedness and <coughs> a good stable foundation. That's probably the best thing, if anything, that they gave us. It gave me the niche to my music, because um, I'm a musician, and and um, I went through all types of music from Baroque, opera, jazz, um, modern music, and the only way I really found the way I wanted to go was through the faith that I have, and it was really from the core of our family that I got that faith. You're dealing with a human being who's had an extraordinary experience and is bursting with knowledge and wants to tell all that he knows but sometimes cannot. And it leaks out over the years and persistent questioning and, re and, and uh, going over the events very carefully, trying to remember the, what I call, parables that the non-terrestrials told him, trying to figure it out ourselves, what they meant, what the knowledge was, and realizing that it was we who had to do the searching and find out what it all meant, that we were not going to be given a textbook for aliens. We had to figure it out ourselves. And when we finally did, we found out that we had it in us all the time because We've been seated by our ex non-terrestrial ancestors. So it was there. It just had to be probed, which means that we couldn't, we didn't lead an average, normal, everyday life, although we did this to maintain family. Our minds were always probing and always interested in reaching into that exciting field of non-terrestrials and what it really meant to us as humankind because there's more to us than one can ever imagine. When the space people ended their contact with Menger in 1958, they left many unanswered questions. Well, they left. Uh, the original angelic people that I talked with years ago in the uh, 50s, in the 30s, a girl on a rock, and then the 50s, and, and the many trips in the craft, uh, they said that they would be back in 2012, uh, that they go in cycles. Like, you know, but I believe that they are time travelers and that they have bases on Venus, Mars, and many other planets. Uh, I asked them once, well, where did you come from? And they said, we have just come from the planet you call Venus. Well. That doesn't mean they're Ven Venusians. They're, they're travelers. They might have a base there. When our astronauts went to the moon and they came back, they were not moon men. They traveled there and back. They were Earth people. So who is to say where they come from? The one thing I'm sure is, almost sure, they don't come from this planet. And they're way ahead of us in political, scientific, and religious understanding. I asked them, why are you here? Well, are you here to heal people or solve all our problems and blah, 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 all this? He said, no, it is against our universal laws 
to, to interfere in any civilization which we descend upon. Your record, your history shows that at your advanced civilizations have advanced on lower civilizations and have destroyed them. They've been here thousands of years ago when there was oceans where, there's, where, there, where there is now land and where there was then land there are now oceans. And when they come back the civilizations have gone down, disappeared like Atlantis and some of the others. They come back to check on, on us they are our ancestors. They helped us to rise up from Homo sapiens to where we are now, to a thinking human being who can make tools and who invent te technological uh, things to help humans live a, a better life. They said that they have laid down laws thousands of years ago that are some of, most of them are in our scriptures today. Various Bibles all over the world, holy books all over the world have come, they said, from extraterrestrial contacts because they were considered gods in those days and looked up to and worshipped. We even made statues that looked like them. And so uh, they said, all we have to do is read our scriptures, live the life it recommends in the scriptures. All the Bibles all over the world said, thou shalt not kill, don't kill. Don't covet your neighbor's wife, don't do that. Love thy neighbor, do that. Moses, Buddha, Jesus, all said all of these things, they were contacted by these aliens, angelic uh, beings also. Connie Menger believes that there is a strategy behind the proceeding of the extraterrestrials, a program to educate us step by step. The alien receptiveness program is to gradually make us aware of our birthright but it has to be a very slow process and the memory of who we are and what we are is locked in our mythology, it's locked in our ancient scriptures, it's locked in ancient books, it's all over the world. If you will collate the uh, information, you will see the pattern emerge. However, we have to go very slowly because the memory of that has been obliterated from most of humankind. And as a matter of fact, we may have been a quarantined planet for a long stretch of time. And now that we are being monitored again, and some of the brain cells that they so, so graciously gave us are beginning to expand and they are beginning to recognize, at least a lot of us are beginning to recognize, we belong to a galactic family. Now, how, what, what is our purpose? Our purpose is to inform as many people as possible and give some scientific background to that, to show them that there is a possibility that we are not alone and that we come from a very different heritage other than anthropoid. As a matter of fact, we're children of the stars, but we've come through an evolutionary process because that's nature's way of producing better forms for better life expressions. They leak information out either by direct isolated contact cases and or holographic means to get the message out slowly so that the mind has a chance to adjust. There is a mental adjustment that needs to be done. And that needs to be done first on a slow scale and then as it accelerates it will become worldwide and there that's where the consciousness upliftment comes in that if once they know that there is others out there and they're very much like us and that's why they're sending those entities that look most like us and are probably very close to us biologically as I said before because they're our family and there is another reason it must be done slow on a slow process because a higher culture will always destroy the lower 
a lower structure. We have infrastructure in our industries, in our governments, in our religions that would fight so, so fiercely against this thought or against others coming in because after all the vested interests have control of this planet and control of the countries and control of the wealth. They, they, they don't want to have to deal with this on a hostile level. It has to be done slowly and it has to be changing the mental set first. It's one reason they're here is for a spiritual uh, uh, reason to develop us more on a spiritual level. Technology is advancing quicker and going uh, further ahead than our spirituality and that's very dangerous. Personally I feel that we have to have a greater reverence for life, all life, greater respect for our planet, greater expression of intelligence between each other, and greater care and responsibility for everything that we do. We have to take responsibility and take charge for what is happening today because that is the only way we can change it. And once we do these things, we become, I wouldn't like to use the word worthy, we become more uh, receptive to contacts with other people.